Welcome to Camp Podcast. I am pianist Unmiko, and I serve as president of the Contemporary Art Music Project, or CAMP. CAMP is an organization that promotes innovative art music and collaborates with composers and performing artists. One of many activities we do is our podcast series. Our hosts explore a wide range of topics from marginalized composers in the music history to current collaborations. Tonight, I am your host, and I am delighted to have Tida Bonkos, the president of Modern Marimba. Modern Marimba is Sarasota-based new music organization, and it is one of camp supporters. Hi, Tida. Thank you so much for all of your your work and supporting us and being here as our guest. Hi, thanks for having me. So um, before I ask you about modern marimba, um, I am curious about you as a, a musician and percussionist. Um, so I'll start with what you inspi- what inspired you to uh, become a musician and choose this path? So I did not grow up in a musical family. So once I discovered that someone can learn music and actually play music, I was super, super fascinated. Um, and it still inspires me uh, today after spending uh, the majority of my life in music. Um, I think music is really magical and with great power comes great responsibility. And because I've benefited in my personal and professional life um, with the practice of learning, performing, organizing, um, and still listening to music, um, I I have a deep love and respect for what it is and what it it can do for our society. So um, that's what keeps me going. And um, that's how it all started. Yeah, it is true. I, uh, my teacher also used to say that uh, music is such a powerful thing that they can change the world even in in direct way. So yeah, totally agree with you in that regard. Yeah, um, and especially it, uh, related to what you do with more than marimba, um, I think it's just really amazing and. I really admire all, all your works, really. Thank you. Likewise. Uh, did you have any particular uh, reason to um, choose the instrument percussion? There, I mean, of course, there are so many different instruments. Um, yeah, that's like the typical answer that people are like, oh, I love playing on pots and pans. Right. I love so many <laughs> instruments, right? And like right. the reason I started on percussion was a completely practical one because um, my mom is, uh, is a single mom. She's a refugee from Laos and she was um, raising my brother and I uh, here in the States and we were born here and uh, we didn't have a lot of money. So because I love music, I was like, wow, I really want to study this and figure out how do people do that? Um when I started uh, in sixth grade beginning band, the cheapest thing that we could <laughs> uh, afford was a stick bag, which had oh. drumsticks, bell mallets, and timpani mallets. And like, that's the reason I got into percussion. Yeah. So, well, not that's a, not a yeah. fancy answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I'm usually not looking for fancy answer. It's usually, <laughs> I think usually people just choose their instruments like, it's sometimes totally random and yeah, or some other practical reasons. And yeah, yeah. I can tell you why yeah. I l- stayed with percussion. And mm-hmm. um, sure, it's because I just grew to love listening because in band and like listening to music like on the radio as a kid growing up, um, you know, percussion wasn't necessarily uh, a solo instrument that was like broadcast, you know, in mainstream radio music. So I just got, I really enjoyed listening. And so when percussion did turn up, it's like, oh, it's like a touch thing. It's like a moment you have to understand what's happening and and not mess up. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, a lot of percussionists also play in the orchestra. We often think as it's just kind of instrument that that's orchestra kind of instrument that's part of the orchestra. And also, I think a lot of percussionists really want to be in the orchestra. 
Yeah, especially in the culture, you know, there's also a marching band where the percussion plays a lot. Right, but, right. Um, but in yeah, in in Western culture, you know, orchestra or percussion is definitely a complement. Right. Yeah. Well, you talked about I I read a little bit of uh, from the modern marimba's website and how where the marimba the word of marimba came from and all that. So uh, you probably know uh, about this the, the use of percussion instrument in other culture. Yes, I, I don't know as much as I think I should <laughs> because I went to school in the States. But, um, you know, it appears in a lot of Asian cultures. Um, I know like in the Bali, you know, uh, there's mm-hmm. the gamelan. And right. um, I know that it appears and obviously it came from Africa uh, as a right. relative of the xylophone. Um and then it basically has made it or way it's around around the world and and um, in Laos and Thailand where like my family's from uh, it's called the Renat um, so it has different has different you know it's it's appeared in different ways kind of all at the same time. Yes, do you uh, still have family in Laos or any kind of contact? Yeah, I do. Um, our family is kind of spread out around the world right now. Um, but uh, we still have a family home in Pakse, which is in southern Laos. And um, I have aunts and uncles who are like snowbirds between like Europe oh. and Laos. Yeah, they love to spend uh, the winters there. Um, so there's a lot of, pe- of people going in and out. And uh, I have an aunt who owns a really amazing coffee and tea farm there. Oh, wow. That sounds yeah. great. <laughs> yeah, she's awesome. <laughs> Do you have any... Um music or contact any musicians you know there or any possible collaboration <laughs> anything <laughs> not like that? yet the only person <laughs> i know um is uh, uh what's i forgot her name her last name is adler uh and so, uh, dr adler i'll call her that um it teaches thai uh, music at ucl ucla and I met mm. her throughout like during the pandemic and she came and did a class for uh, our summer camp um supina that's her name and mm. um did a whole presentation on the renat and like thai and and lao court music um and then performed so she's the only one i know right now i see but that i think that would be really fascinating to yeah bring the music for sure maybe to, if i do like yeah. a sabbatical and Mm, go yeah. to Laos and study. Right. Yeah. <laughs> not not right now, but maybe. <laughs> yeah. Dream someday. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, well, um, maybe we can move on to uh, about modern marimba. And uh, 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 if you can tell us about, you know, how, how you started this organization and... Uh, just kind of backstory about uh, uh, this organization and uh, also probably brief timeline <laughs> how you oh, sure. did this. Yeah. Yeah. So I played marimba like a lot of American kids like uh, who start band like in middle school and high school. And then at some point, um, someone told me and I believe them um, that marimba wasn't a serious instrument. And I need to focus more on orchestral music because that's what that's what I need to do to win a job, right? And you yeah. know, as, when you get older, no one plays marimba. And I was like, okay, so you know, it's like very good. Like I'll just do what people tell me to do. Um, and while I would, when I, once I got out of school, I didn't play marimba at all, really. You know, mm-hmm. working in orchestras and doing chamber music, it just it didn't really come up. Um, and I found myself being a little nervous anytime I was like assigned a mallet part or, you know, all this stuff. And I, I just kind of felt like I, my, my learning, like I wasn't learning as much as I, and growing as much as I knew I could. Mm-hmm. So I just started playing again and it was really great for my mental health. It helped me grow as a musician and I l- met a lot more people and learned a, a lot of repertoire and it was really fun. And, um, uh, my partner is also a percussionist, so we started playing music together, chamber music together, um, and we did a couple concerts in Sarasota, and my neighbors and my friends really, really love it. And mm-hmm. so uh, in 
late 2019, like right before the pandemic, we mm-hmm. decided to start Modern Rumba so we could like re- f- formalize what we were already doing mm-hmm. um, in Sarasota. And doing that really helped my artistic mental health <laughs> uh, because it was able for I was able to um, grow and create a community outside of the orchestral world, which can uh, many times be toxic and mm-hmm. male dominated. And so this is, has, has become kind of like my, my I, w- I don't want to say baby, but like just something that I nurture, like a plant <laughs> mm-hmm. um, or a garden. So I really love to collaborate with other people and uh, learn more about organizing uh, the arts and how to navigate that world. And um, once I met uh, Steph Davis, mm-hmm. who is uh, our VP, an amazing artistic director person Mm kind of everybody kind of does everything um Mm -hmm. once I met Steph through Instagram I knew that we had a great team and we could like compliment each other um they have a lot of things in common with me um because number one they play percussion uh they grew up in Florida around Orlando area Mm -hmm. and like me like we both grew up um navigating these predominantly white institutions of higher learning and so we, we both have are on the same page as, about creating something that's like more supportive of uh, people of color, LGBT people, uh, women, um, disabled, the disabled community and all that kind of stuff. So we have been playing concerts and navigating the pandemic still <laughs> and just <laughs> kind of like on this journey, which is really cool. Yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, I think we will have time to talk about um, what Modern Marimba has done, not not just in terms of music, but also how uh, it has contributed to the um, the racial justice and um, um, how you kind of have that education. You, I felt like you built this a strong education system in Sarasota. So <laughs> it's really great. Um, and I've, I've been to, uh, I've, well, I went to uh, online events. And then also I uh, uh, was in one of the in-person uh, yes. events. Yeah, I remember. Thank you so much for yeah, your support. <laughs> sure, of course. Um, and I, I really could feel there was this sense of community between you guys. Um, and also this uh community engagement i mean there were a lot of people and how what i felt was a lot of support from the community and all this all this engagement you do um uh, i think it's been really really great all, all this unusual kind of um you know performance and concert venues and all kinds of that so if you can tell us about it that would be great Sure. Yes. I love building community and I love reaching out like um, like we got together. Right. And talked and right. you know, modern member supported. We want to support our local community. And I know we have our virtual worlds and everything, and it's so easy to get kind of lost in that. Mm-hmm. Um, but as we are meeting in person, it's so important for me, especially living in Sarasota, where there it's just not as diverse as like St. Pete and Tampa. Mm-hmm. Um, the connections that I make with, uh, with people here are, um, we have to hold on to each other, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, and be, and make sure that we're on the same, we're on the, we're on the same page and we're moving together and we're helping each other out. Um, that's just has been really important to me. I have a real, a lot of support from my neighbors, obviously I've said that. And just Sarasota is still very much a small town. So you meet, you meet a lot of people and you keep seeing them over and over again. So it's like, yeah, we got to you know, figure it out and, and work together. So the first concert was in my own home and I actually sold tickets on Eventbrite <laughs> and like, they were like strangers in my home. And I was like, this was actually a good idea, even though it could have been a total disaster, but it was totally fine. Um, we had over 50 people and we, I couldn't wow. support more than 50 people in the house. I know. So, uh, we had like a waiting list too. And, um, it was called Zen in the art of marimba. And it was a focus on, uh, not only Japanese composers, but composers that have been inspired um, by Zen Buddhism, uh, Japan, um, especially the concept of Ma and space. Um, So that was our first concert and it was really fun. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But our concert season is uh, three, like, 
devoted concerts um, that we have been trying to schedule. And it's very difficult in Sarasota because there's not a lot of spaces for groups mm-hmm. um, of our size. And I know you know this because you go through right. the same thing because we try to avoid places that are like not going to be safe for, you know, the queer community or, you know, doesn't have a lot of disability access or, you know, those kinds of things. So we basically avoid churches because um, mm-hmm. just historically they haven't had a really great track record. So we have to try to find places and we've partnered with uh, the West Coast Black Theater Troupe, uh, WSLR Fogartyville. They do a lot of our jazz concerts. And so we partner with people who already have the infrastructure to be able to produce these concerts. Um, so we have three of those. And then we've done a lot of outdoor concerts, in, mm-hmm. especially in uh, MLK Junior Park in Sarasota, where there's a uh, the Newtown Farmer's Market. And so the point of the market is to get... Um, the black community here in Sarasota to buy fresh fruits and veggies and they can mm-hmm. use their, um, I think it's called EBT, like, uh, like the food stamp program. Uh, they can use the money and their tokens there to buy like fresh fruits and veggies. So th- there's a really great pavilion there. We've done concerts. It's been free to the public. Um, we've had a lot of like unhoused people will come up and like ask us questions, you know, and, um, it, we have a conversation with almost anyone who is interested in the music. And I try to program things that are like an hour long, um, a diverse group of composers and types of pieces um, that aren't like super exhausting, you know, and um, mm-hmm. throw in, throw in like, you know, something that's maybe more challenging for the average, you know, listener. Um, but with the proper context, I think you can listen to almost any piece. But I do understand that people's ears have a, you know, a, a lifespan of maybe 45, 50 minutes before they're like checked out, which mm-hmm. I also feel that way. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. it's too much. Um, right. So we do that. And plus the panels and the, and the live streams that you've you've seen, they tackle things like uh, uh, environmental justice, uh, mm-hmm. radical thought in uh, in, in music and, uh, Western music, um, women's, women's programs, Mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. So we're open to anything really. Yeah. It's, uh, really, um, great idea. I think to, uh, engage more people from the community and using all this, uh, different venues, because I also felt like, um, I mean, it's great to play in you know, concert halls and, you know, those all conventional venues. Um, but sometimes it feels really trapped in a way that mm-hmm. you can't really, uh, you only reach, I felt like you only reach certain people. Um, yes. You know, certain class and certain type of people who, you know, always go to that right. kind of concert and you, you don't, you know, there's usually no... Not many questions you um, are asked. It's usually the pieces probably they have heard so many times and yeah. things like that. Yeah, all the things so, are like anti-community and um, right. <laughs> That's even true. if the concert is free, you right. know, uh, someone who's not used to going to an orchestra concert or or a ch- small chamber music concert in a venue that's like a concert hall, it's mm-hmm. intimidating. Because I remember it being intimidating when I was a high school kid. I didn't know how to dress while everyone's like shushing me, you know. (laughs) Um, That's true. (laughs) Yeah, there's like a cultural, there's a cultural, I don't know, mismatch for I think the types of things that we're doing. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, now I think about it, it's, you know, I I didn't really realize because I I played for uh, really long time and always go to concert and you know things like that but for someone who never been there it's yes like people sh- like doing shh like you have to be quiet and yeah. dressed up and oh yeah that can be pretty intimidating it is for sure yeah. even if it's free it's like nope I'm not going <laughs> right 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 if i have to be so careful and tiptoeing all the time yes you know why why would i go there I would feel yeah 
it's it's totally yeah yeah and and so part of our mission is to create these safe spaces and it's like mm -hmm. when uh for example it is it, because it, racial justice is a part of this you know mm -hmm. if you're a black person and you navigating the space of whiteness in the united states of america you're basically always living in in some sort of fear so why mm -hmm. would when you have free time why would mm -hmm. you go to a place where you're just not welcome right and right. you know it, it it amps up the the possibility for police to be involved um you know say you get kicked out of the concert or just feeling uncomfortable you know mm -hmm. yeah i mean that's i think that's how you know all this uh kind of not not being in in the same kind of equal place um mm -hmm. as a classical music classical musician i think it all started um from there actually and also you know why people have criticized that it's you know i mean i i think it's a little bit too simple to just say you know this classical music is just racist music i, I mean i don't quite think <laughs> it's that simple and i don't want to put it that way right but there is certainly that um i don't know kind of um more for more for kind of privileged and Yes. This is for, you know, for someone in certain class or certain um certain education. education. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that being I, I think more of like, oh, it's racist is bad. It's more like why is that the default of right. the culture of classical music? It doesn't have to be that way. Exactly. You know? Yeah, it doesn't have to be. I mean, I think also that's why that it um shuns all this younger people away i mean why they're you know why you you see certain generation a lot more in a classical concert mm -hmm. yes yeah so it's it's great i mean i think it's you know like also that's my dream that people come to concert and one of a camp's concert and say like, oh, this is really cool. I can, yeah. <laughs> you know, come and enjoy. So for sure, yeah. Um, also, I'm really interested in you, you know uh, modern marimba's uh, this all this um, activities in um, educating young students and in a way educating this whole community and the whole city. I um, think it's so important. Uh, education is almost everything, and and you're doing it, and you're doing it through music. You're doing, of course, you're teaching music, but you're doing, you know, you're teaching even more, even bigger things through music. So, yeah, yeah, we we try all the time, and um, I, you know, through the pandemic, I did not go into the public schools really to teach, which is something I have always mm -hmm. done since the beginning of my mm -hmm. career. Um, and that was that was it, it. I miss it, and I still miss it. Like because you know, I I still don't necessarily feel safe. And with all the regulation that's happening in Florida, mm -hmm. with what you can teach students, um, I personally like I can't I can't go into those spaces because I'm gonna do mm -hmm. what I'm gonna do, and like that creates issues for me. It creates issues for the teachers. And I know a lot of them are scared to just go for it because they don't want to lose their jobs. And, you know, I understand mm -hmm. put them in you know difficult positions. So um, we've been doing virtual things. We have um, a summer festival and we actually um, just bought our first marimba for students. Wow. And yeah, I know it was huge. And it's like it wiped out like half our bank account. But I was like, OK, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> all right, we did it. <laughs> so we have partnered with the Sarasota Music Conservatory um, here in the city. And it's uh, they're just off of Central Ave and uh, Fruitville. And mm -hmm. uh, they have a small school and they had this back office and they're like, what do you think? And I was like, yes, this would be so amazing. It like perfectly fits a marimba and it's away from like the other classrooms, you know. Um, so we have yeah. a, an, an Adams four and a third Rosewood marimba um, and we can use that for students. We can use it to take out to do educational concerts because it's fairly portable. We bought cases. Mm -hmm. um, so as we emerge from uh, the pandemic and, and kind of living with COVID in our lives and trying to be careful, we can mm -hmm. reach out to students um, 
who are maybe in after school school programs. I would love to hook up with the Boys and Girls Club. Um, we have a partnership, like I said, with West Coast Black Theater Troupe. They have an, a they have a really great summer theater program for students. So they're just more opportunities for us to be in the public eye and reaching out to students and doing things, maybe things outside of like public schools. So I'm really excited about getting that. And actually the marimba is coming on tomorrow, Saturday. It'll arrive here. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow that's big. That's really exciting. Mm-hmm. Now yeah. we do. Now the the marimba is made out of rosewood, and you know it's an opportunity to have a discussion with the students about like why we don't use drumsticks on the, the rosewood marimba, and like mm-hmm. where does the rosewood come from? Is it ethically sourced? Probably not. Disclaimer. Um, but like mm-hmm. how we <laughs> use that and respect the fact that we have this instrument, and we want to preserve um, its use for many, many, many years. So right, yeah was really exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, um, I think I uh, can go back a little bit uh, about, you know, um, and make a kind of connection to what you talked about uh, in terms of this community engagement. And um, your your concerts and all the virtual events that's, uh, of course, brought a lot of cool uh, new music, but also it brought, you know, this other subjects to to the table. Um, uh, and it, I always felt like it looks like really great f- platform to discuss different topics um, that's outside of music. Uh, and you, I think... Uh, your recent project probably was about this mental health, um, and also, of course, there there's this uh, women's right erasure issue. Um, there was Earth Day concert, so all all kinds of these things um, uh, that you talked about. I think it's really uh, really fascinating, and also it uh, sets you really uh apart kind of from from any you know ordinary uh organization music organization yeah the mental health and music i mean mental health is such a hot topic today mm-hmm. because we are navigating um everyone says it's such unprecedented unprecedented times but i mean if you, yeah it's collectively as as human beings i mean the pandemic and the exacerbation of the climate crisis um, and just all the war, colonialism, all that stuff that is coming, it's like getting really ugly and we kind of see it in the news. Right. It's like so present. So mm-hmm. uh, using music as mental health, does it help? Um, where is its limits? You know, um, how does it affect people who are listening? Are they, you know, um, are, are they use it for a healing thing um, or is it used as a uh, tool of oppression? Uh, those are all things that we like to discuss, and and music is not is is never apart from something that is political and affects the whole planet. Mm-hmm. The you know the pe- the people who work for the organizations, the composers, what they stand for, what they're writing for, and I know like the marimba and the vibraphone bells chimes. Uh, you know, it's a whole twelve. You you know this. Um, you know, uh, using the equal temperament system. You know, that's mm-hmm. a Western construct. Right. How how our ears hear things, um, th- those are all political, and and reinforced through traditions. So we can always have a conversation about uh, that, and then, like I said, with Earth Day and everything, talking about how instruments instruments are manufactured, and mm-hmm. is it equitable? Like, are who are the people who are taking care of the land where the rosewood grows? You know, where is it coming from? Is it like? Are these people being paid a nice wage or is the rosewood being cut down so fast that Mm -hmm. it's affecting their environment? So these are all discussions to be had, you know, while we listen to music, you know. But also I I I love um, the Honorable Elizabeth A. Baker. Mm -hmm. And I went to a panel that uh, interview that she hosted and she's she's always a sound can just exist as a sound and have its beauty in there. And she's right. You know, but how we get to that sound and the circumstances are extremely political, and we should be having those discussions. Because, as far as I'm concerned, you know, uh, you can't separate music 
it, it doesn't have a completely different world. It is part of this world. It is. And we are making music. I mean, human beings are making music. So <laughs> yes. how can we separate those? And, mm -hmm. you know, we don't, I mean, I we don't realize that's like um, how many things actually influence music and music listening and music making. Yeah. And even sound like, you know, the earth is yeah. talking to us too. It's, it's vibrating at a frequency. True. You have no, noise pollution, all that kind of stuff. And I don't know, I feel like we can be more aware of that, how that music plays and sound plays in our life. Absolutely. Who uh, get to decide these topics? <laughs> I, you know, it just kind of happens. Like either someone will, mm. like in a board meeting, someone will bring it up or mm. I'll just have, you know, it's an art, it's a creative artistic thing. It's like, or I'll just right. be talking to people and then this idea comes up or, you know, it's like, when can we do this concert? And I'm like, hmm, Earth Day's coming up. How about that? And you can, you know, put stuff together and uh, people contact me, just, you know, conversations that I have with people and kind of how I'm feeling, how much time I have to, you know, mm -hmm. organize and everything together. <laughs> right. Because I, I know it, it seems like we're doing a lot of things, but we have such a small mm -hmm. budget. Uh, and, you know, I'm right. volunteering and doing this and a lot, a, a lot of our board does volunteer and I try to be mindful right. of that. Because, mm -hmm. you know, in trying to be equitable, and I know the nonprofit industrial complex is, you know, a tool of oppression as well. There's only so much we can do. Right. So uh, I try to be as equitable, equitable as possible when I'm in relationship with uh, people from marginalized groups and how much time I, you know, spend with them. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, great. I mean, it's always and that I also experience the same yeah. thing, yeah. right? There are so many things I want to do, but but there's money live and yes, time, right? <laughs> <laughs> money and time, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, um, what are your uh, upcoming uh, projects and what are the plans? Future so, plans. Uh, future plans. Right now, we're trying to figure out what we're going to do next year. Um, so we're figuring out budget stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But we just received a new solo Merva piece um, that we helped commission, and it's written by composer Jonathan Scales, and mm -hmm. I think I believe it's three movements long. And so uh, we're looking the kind of program uh, concert around that piece for next season. Um, but for the rest of the this this year, um, I'm working with a sound healing musician in Sarasota named Ed Russell, and we are participating uh -huh. in a multicultural festival called the We Are One uh, Festival, and it's hosted by Newtown Nation, and I'll, that'll be at MLK Park on May 8th. So um, uh, that's a, a, a realm that I have never really like engaged with, so <laughs> uh, I'm excited about that partnership. Um, and then... There's a, a Pride Festival um, in May as well on May 14th. And so we're sponsoring this uh, vibraphone-led band from Orlando called mm -hmm. Tuesday Again. So they're actually going to be opening uh, an entire day of music. So I think they start at 3... It's either... Yeah, I think it's 3.15. So it'll be... Uh, they're going to close down a couple of streets and they're going to have a stage. So it'll be pretty cool to hear some music at the uh, Pride wow. Festival. Yeah, it'll be cool. And then um, shameless plug, I have to put this in, but the Giving Challenge is coming up April 26th through the 27th, noon to noon, and Monomer is participating. And so all donations made on that day um, from $25 to $100 are like 100% matched by the Patterson Foundation. So that's kind of that and like Giving Tuesday in December, those are like our two like fundraisers mm -hmm. that we do for our season. So um, that's kind of what's coming up. And through the summer, we will just offer um, open houses and lessons and all that kind of stuff to students. That's kind of where, when we focus on our educational program. Great. Yeah. And uh, all this can be found uh, from the website modernmarimba.org. Yes, right? it is. Yes. We're active on Facebook and social yes. media as well. Oh, sorry. Uh, Instagram. <laughs> Instagram, yeah. Yes. And Facebook. Yeah. Do you do you guys have a YouTube page? We do. I don't have a lot of okay. um stuff up there because when we when we do our um virtual programs, I leave them up on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, right. 
But then like when I put them on YouTube, I take them like, cause we have contracts with people. So it's like we t- put it up there for a month and I take it down. So oh, I, I wish we had more. Yeah. I, you know, yeah. I, I did a lot of the producing of like the virtual stuff mm-hmm. and I realize, and I know you know this too, that it has to be like high quality, great mics and, you know, um, <laughs> the bouquet has to be perfect. And I, we're just not there yet. So I put some recordings here and there, but I, right. I want everything that is on the website to be like, uh, like very nicely produced. So when we have the money, I know, well, we can do more of those kinds of things. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, um, it was great talking to you and thank you for speaking to me. Um, and I will make my exit here and we can listen to the Blacker, the Berry by uh, Step Davis, who's vice president, right? Yes. Um, at the end of the this show. Um would you mind telling us about the piece composer um, and this particular performance of the yes. recording? So this was a this was done during the pandemic uh, last April for Earth Day, and it was a consortium between Prism Percussion uh, Duo, and they're based out of uh, San Francisco, and they champion LGBT composers. Spectrum Ensemble, same deal, but they're based out of um, Dallas area and us and um so each of us had a movement that we recorded uh remotely from each other and the video producer was stephen hall from spectrum ensemble and i thought they did a really great job uh putting together this thing so hopefully there we can put the video out on uh youtube at some point um so steph wrote the piece the black or the berry and i'll read what they said um Program notes. So, quote, I haven't written a complete program note yet, as I'm still reading what others have written about the topic. But the piece speaks to how colorism draws a parallel between darker skin and masculinity and how that might affect darker, darker skin bodies. uh, Sorry, darker skin folks relationship with gender and expression. Great. Thank you. Um, Is uh, there anything else that you want to uh, talk about the composer staff? Davis. So Steph um, is based in Boston, Massachusetts, even though they grew up in Florida um, in the Orlando area. And so they are a grad student at Boston Conservatory and they study with Nancy Zeltzman. And um, I think Steph calls themselves a cultural activist. So they are a composer, they perform and teach and are just involved in social justice uh, in the arts in general. And so um, I'm really delighted that they joined Mana Marimba and they have just such a great asset um, and, and human being. And I learned so much from them. Great. Yeah. Well, I hope to uh, talk to you again soon and hope to see you in person someday. Likewise. Soon. <laughs> and I like to say, Sabaidi Pimai, it's the Lunar uh, New Year in Laos. So, oh, thank you. Great. Support us by donating. You can go to our website, www.contemporaryartmusicproject.org, and simply click the donate button. Help us continue our podcast, festival, and other exciting projects. Thank you for listening. I will see you next time.